one, please. Commence and read in verse 12 again. Giving thanks unto the Father, <clears throat> who made us meet and partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And we praise you today because you loved us so much to send your son to die upon the cross of Calvary for wretched sinners like us. We thank you that even though we didn't deserve your salvation, you loved us enough to, by your grace, provide that salvation. And Father, we pray today that as we consider <coughs> yet again the preeminence of our Savior, that Father, you would allow us to exalt his name yet again through your word. Give me wisdom, I pray that I might, Father God, do justice to the statements of your word regarding your Son. That, Lord, we might leave today singing your praise and saying, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Father, we pray that you would give me wisdom from on high, that you guide me as I speak, that I might say that which you would have me to say, that our hearts might be blessed and refreshed and encouraged by your word today as we consider your exalted son. Guide our time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we commence this study on the preeminence of Christ, we said that there is possibly... No paragraph in the New Testament that contains more consecrated doc concentrated doctrine <clears throat> about Christ than right here in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 12 to 20. Here the Apostle Paul presents four unanswerable arguments to prove the preeminence of Christ. The false teachers at Colossae denied his preeminence. They declared that Jesus Christ was nothing more than just a man. And Paul says that's not true. And he's declared to us that Jesus Christ is preeminent because he's the Savior in verses 13 and 14. He's preeminent because he's the creator in verses 15 to 17. He's preeminent because he's the head of the church in Colossians 1, 18. Now to ensure that we understand his place and his glory, he says in verse 19, he says, It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now Paul has already called Jesus Christ God's dear Son. Back in verse 13, he said, Whom delivered us from the power of darkness, that translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son. So Paul has already introduced this theme that this is all about the Son of God. So as we come to verse 19, it shouldn't surprise us that it says, For it pleased the Father that in him 
should all fall as dwell. Now you'll note that in the, the words the father in italics because they don't appear in the original. There's no Greek word for the father. But it's implied in the context. For the passage starts out with the declaration of Paul giving thanks unto God and then talks about Jesus Christ as son, the means by which God did all these things. And so now the father is pleased that in him, that's in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And so Paul moves forward in his argument. And he declares here a remarkable statement about the fullness that dwells in Jesus Christ. And here we're given two truths about Christ to once again declare Christ's preeminence. In fact, in these last verses of this section, we have what I've entitled the Declaration of Preeminence. The Declaration of Preeminence. This is the final piece in this great passage, this great section of Colossians chapter 1 on the, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, about the position and the person, the work of who Christ is, making him qualified to be our Redeemer. To answer the question of the Gnostics, to bring to uh, an end the questioning of the person of Jesus Christ. The apostle now comes to a crescendo, if you like, and all of this. He's just declared that he is, that he might have the preeminence, and now he just says, as though he just has a few more things he wants to declare about the Savior, the declaration of preeminence. And two points this morning only. First of all, the indwelling fullness. The indwelling fullness. The first fact that we need to understand about Jesus Christ when it comes to this matter of preeminence is this, that in him all fullness dwells. The indwelling fullness. Now verse 18, of course, gives to you and I the theme for the entire section where it ends up at the end of verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The reason why all these things are listed, the reason why all these things are true about Jesus Christ is so that he might have the preeminence. This was God's purpose in making his son the savior, the creator, the head of the church. God the Father wants to declare the credentials of his Son, declaring that his Son is indeed qualified to be our Savior. The word preeminence, of course, magnifies the unique position of Jesus Christ. The word preeminence means to have first place. It denotes a permanent position of priority and a permanent position of authority. Jesus Christ stands in a position of priority. He is first. And he stands in a place of authority because of his position as God. He is also the authoritative one. He is God, a very God. Therefore, he's preeminent. And since he is preeminent, he's the all-sufficient Savior. So now as we come to verse 19, we're told that God the Father, who makes the saints meet to be partakers of the heavenly glory, who delivers them from the power and the dominion of sin, and translates them into the kingdom of his dear Son, and who by Christ redeems us, is pleased to share his glory, his place of priority and authority with his Son. The Father is pleased to share with his Son his glory. Now, the word pleased here means approved. This is a declaration that is given to us that says that God approves of this truth. God the Father is the one who declares that the Son is God. This is not some man-made doctrine. This is not like the Gnostics or the other false teachers of, of Paul's day who made up stories. This is not some man-made doctrine. This is a doctrine that comes from the very halls of heaven. 
God the Father himself declares that God the Son is God. And he approves of that doctrine of declaring the Son to be God. Now that shouldn't surprise us because God will not share his glory with anyone. For he is God. And because he's God, he's above all. He himself is the preeminent one. So therefore, for him to share his glory with anyone means that that one he's sharing it with must be on a par with him. And so it says he is pleased to share his glory with Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is God. It's clearly seen in the word fullness. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness dwell. The word fullness is a technical term in the vocabulary. Actually, it comes from the vocabulary of the Gnostics, the false teachers of Paul's day. And the word fullness means the sum total of all divine power and attributes. The sum total of all divine power and attributes. It refers to the total essence of deity. So in other words, all that God is, is all that Christ is. And all that Christ is, is all that God is. You can't differentiate between the two. We believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, equal in essence, distinct in person. When it comes to the essence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is no distinction. They are God. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. And here this word fullness describes that very fact that when the fullness dwells in someone, that is the absolute essence, the total essence of deity dwelling in Christ. So whatever divine excellencies, whatever divine essence is found in God the Father is also in God the Son. Look in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Because the apostle picks this theme up again. And he says in verse 9, For in him, that's in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now the Gnostics use the term fullness for the collection of emanations or angelic powers coming from God. And Paul warns the church that the true fullness dwells in Christ alone. This is not just something coming forth from God. This is dwelling in Christ. That is why he's qualified to save you and I. That's why verses 13 and 14 are true. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The reason why that is true is because of who Christ is. He's God. And the reason why Christ takes the precedence over every creature in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, the reason why he is the firstborn of every creature is because he is God. The reason why he is the head of the church in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, is because he is God. So in all these things that are preceding verse 19 is a declaration of the person of Jesus Christ. And he is preeminent, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And in saying this, the apostle was meeting the false teachers on their own ground. Because they denied Christ's deity. But Paul proclaimed it. 
Paul says that God himself declares and approves of the teaching that Christ is God. The teaching of the deity of Christ is a God-ordained doctrine. Those who want to argue with you and I about the Trinity, want to argue with you and I about whether or not Jesus Christ is God, whether he's a God or God, and want to change John chapter 1 where it says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and they want to change it into us, a God. They're standing on sinking sand, beloved. Because the Bible over and over again that Jesus Christ is God of very God. And here the apostle declares it with absolute terms. It pleased the Father. God approves of this doctrine that Jesus Christ is God. It pleased the Father that in him all fullness dwell. The eternal Son, Christ had all divine fullness. When he became a man... He manifests that essential fullness in his redemptive work. It's vital that Jesus Christ be God. But it's because he's God that he can redeem us. If Jesus Christ was simply a man, then he would have been subject to all that you and I are subject to. He would have been born a sinner. And he would have needed a redeemer. And he would have had to pay the consequence of his sin. And he would have died, as all other religious, religious leaders die, without hope. But the fact that Jesus Christ, God of very God, becomes a man, is the means by which Christ, as the God-man, can die upon the cross of Calvary for you and I and purchase our redemption. This is a vital understanding that we must have Jesus Christ is God of very God for without that he could not be our Redeemer in him there is such dignity such authority such power and moral excellence that he alone can redeem us this is to us the most precious truth Jesus Christ, the God-man. This is a fact that is fundamental truth, a truth that cannot be denied. If we're to believe the word of God, we have to believe that Jesus Christ left heaven's glory and became a man. And as the God-man, totally God, totally man, and as the God-man, Jesus, Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary to purchase our redemption because being the God-man, he was sinless and able to die in our place. You know, we have a Savior who is in no respect deficient in wisdom, in power, in grace to redeem and to save us, for he is God. Think about this for a moment. There is nothing necessary to be done in our salvation that he is not qualified to do. Whatever was required of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ qualifies. Because remember, the reason why you and I condemn sinners is because we fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, the Redeemer has to match up to the glory of God. He has to be able able to satisfy the righteous demand. Therefore, in Christ, there is nothing deficient, there's nothing missing in him to that is required for our salvation. Why? Because he's God. Whatever God requires, Jesus Christ is, because Jesus Christ is God. There is nothing missing. He is fully qualified. For in him all fullness of God dwells. He is the preeminent, all-sufficient Savior. He is able to save us, for he has all the necessary qualifications to save. And you and I ought to praise God today. Our Savior is qualified before a holy God to save us because he is God. On earth, believers saw his glory. 
The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1 14 tells us. And now, because of who he is, all believers have enjoyed the benefits of his fullness. As John 1 16 says, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. We as believers have received or partaken of the numerous blessings which came by Jesus Christ. You and I are partakers of his fullness. Of his fullness we have received and grace for grace. We receive grace upon grace. We received abundant grace, amazing grace, all-sufficient grace. You and I are saved by grace. Because in him all fullness dwells. In no situation of trouble or efficiency, no enterprise to which we can put our hands Will there be any lack of power to enable us to accomplish his will? We may go to him in all our troubles, in our weaknesses, in our temptations and needs. May all be supplied from his fullness. He is the all-sufficient one. He's the all-sufficient savior. He is the preeminent one. He's God, a very God. For in him the fullness of God dwells. There is no need to add anything to the person or work of Jesus Christ. And that's why on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ could cry, It is finished. It is done. There's nothing more to do. He's the all-sufficient one. The work of salvation was complete. He's all we need. In him is life, and by him we receive eternal life. And for you and I to try and add anything to him or to take anything away from him is to diminish him and dethrone him and make him no longer God. He is God, a very God. The very essence of God it makes him the all-sufficient Savior. But only we are told of the indwelling fullness but we're told, secondly, this fullness dwells in him. It says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. This fullness dwells in him. And the word dwell is equally important as the word fullness. Because it means much more than merely to reside. The form of the verb means to be at home permanently. Greek experts point out that this fullness was not something added to his being that was not natural to him, but that it was part of his essential being, as part of his very constitution, and that permanently. You see, as the Son, as God the Son, I should say, he possessed the complete fullness of the divine essence by eternal right. He is God and has been God from eternity and will continue to be a God into the future. The Father did not say that he was pleased that the Son should become deity. That somehow before his incarnation, he was not God. But at the moment of his incarnation, he became God. He said it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. This is a permanent relationship. It has dwelt with him because this is an absolute necessity for his being. If he is not God, then he is not the Son. See, it pleased the Father to share his glory with the Son for all eternity. For the Son was and is and forever shall be equal 
with the Father. It's no wonder that in verse 18, Paul says that in all things, he might have the preeminence. Somebody said in the plan of God, which involved the subordination of the Son in order to provide redemption, there was no diminishing of the divine attributes. Jesus Christ, when he became a man, he continued to be God. There was no diminishing of the divine attributes. He remained God. He didn't empty himself of his godhood. He laid aside, to a degree, the independent exercise of some of those things and submitted himself to the Father so that he did nothing except the Father told him to do it. But Jesus Christ did not cease to be God when he became a man. Everything that he was in eternity past is what he was when he became a man and what he is today. When God the Son took to himself a perfect and complete humanity, he was and still is God. God cannot be less than what he is. And the Son's total submission to and dependence upon the Father did not change that unalterable truth just because Jesus Christ said, I speak because that's what my Father told me and I act because that's what the Father asked does not mean that he ceased to be God. It doesn't change this unalterable fact. He is God. Second century Corinthian Gnosticism taught that the spirit of the divine Christ came upon the man Jesus at his baptism and left him at his crucifixion. That when Jesus Christ was baptized and the Spirit of God came upon him, that's when he became God. And he remained being God till the moment he was crucified and he gave up the ghost. At that moment, he ceased to be God. But the declaration here of the preeminence of Christ is that the fullness of God dwells in him as a permanent state of being. It has dwelt, it does dwell, and it will dwell. See, the heresy denied what we call the hypostatic union. The fact that Christ possessed two natures, the divine and human, within his single person, that Jesus Christ is totally God, totally man. All that God is, Christ is. And all that man is, Christ is. He is the God-man. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Colossians 2.9. We need to understand that he is God. Contrary to what the Gnostics taught, Jesus Christ was a true human being with a real body, but he was also God, a very God. Isn't that what it says in John chapter 1? Come back there, please. John chapter 1. In verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 1, And the Word was God. Now, if we're wondering who the Word is, we go down to verse 14, because in verse 14 it declares, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So this is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the Word. He was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only one of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was God, and they beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's God, our very God. And that's why he's preeminent. Now, because Jesus Christ is God, he's able to do what no mere man could do. And it's like in this section, the apostles come full circle. He starts out at the beginning praising God, who has made us meet, made us fit, partakers of inheritance and the saints in light. And now he tells us how he has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance 
in life. He's told us by his son. He's told us that Jesus Christ is the redeemer and he can forgive us. And the reason he can do that is because of his preeminence in creation and his preeminence in the church and the fact that he is God, a very God. In him all fullness dwells. And now in verse 20, he brings it right round and he tells us the process by which he made you and I fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And in verse 20 we read, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Verse 20 has, not, has a great power on its own, but when you put it into the context of everything Paul has just said, this verse jumps off the page. You see the preeminent Christ, the one in who all fullness dwells, God of very God, the God-man, he is the one who, having made peace through his blood, has reconciled all things unto himself. This is how he made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of light. Jesus Christ is able to do what no mere man could do, reconcile lost sinners to a holy God. To reconcile simply means to completely change. From a place of hostility to a place of peace. You and I are at enmity with God. You and I, because of our sin, we're at war with God. There is an enmity between us and God. But Jesus Christ... Because of who he is, through his death upon the cross and his shed blood, has changed that position completely. You see, before the end of the sin, God and man experienced unbroken fellowship. After man's sin, that communion was interrupted. We know that. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, and the relationship they had with God was not the same as it was prior to the fall. Man had turned away from God and there was a strain in that relationship, so much so that God had to sacrifice animals in order to provide for them coverings as a picture of what Christ would do one day in dying upon the cross of Calvary. Man needed to be reconciled. Go into 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Try 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, I'll find it in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 18. But all things are of God who hath reconciled to us in, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputed their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 19 in particular. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Reconciliation is always on man's part. Man needs to be reconciled to God. Doesn't, God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. God never did anything to us that needs to be changed. You and I are the ones that caused the problem. We sinned. Adam walked away from God. And so reconciliation is on man's part. We need to be reconciled to God. The wonderful thing is that God moved to reconcile us. And reconciliation was completed at Calvary. Which is what Colossians 1.20 says. Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. He made peace. This is a settled transaction. It's having made peace. That's what he says in verse 20. And having made peace is a settled transaction. This has already happened. Whether or not a man or a woman is saved doesn't matter at this point in time in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. The peace has already been made. Having made peace at Calvary, Christ made peace with God on our behalf. God was satisfied. 
Christ became the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. God was satisfied with the death of Christ upon Calvary. There was nothing more to be done. When Jesus Christ shed his blood, the God-man died in our place. God was satisfied with the work that his son had done upon the cross, and therefore peace has been made. Now, it is provisional in that it's not applied until man, by his free will, receives Christ as Savior. But that doesn't diminish the fact that the reconciliation has already taken place in the sense that peace has been made. God has been satisfied for all men. Because notice what it says in verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. We don't make our own peace with God. Jesus Christ made that peace for us through his work on the cross. And God chose to bring all men back to himself for his glory. God looked down upon sinful men, and because he's not willing that any should perish, he sent his son to die upon the cross of Calvary and shed his precious blood to satisfy his righteous demands so that he is satisfied, so that the peace reconciliation is made for all men there's nothing more to pay there's nothing more to be done it is a settled fact God made the move to reconcile us you and I would not have known him if he had not made himself known to us and you and I would not have been able to make peace with God if God had not first made the peace God the Father, through Jesus Christ, has reconciled all things to himself. That is, that by Christ, God has made provision for the restoration of creation that was corrupted at the fall. All creation, through Christ's death upon the cross of Calvary, has been made, uh, God has made it possible, he's made provision for the restoration of all creation that was corrupted at the fall. And in so doing, he has made provision for salvation for all mankind. He has thereby rendered all men savable. It says, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. He has made provision for the restoration of creation that was corrupted the fall, and that includes you and me at the cross. God rendered all men savable. Doesn't mean that all men are saved. But it means that no one is outside of God's provision of salvation. That's why the Bible can say, for God so loved the world. That's why it can say, whosoever will may come. That's why those verses where, you know, uh, throughout Scripture, it's all inclusive. Christ died for the sins of the world. Because upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ paid the price of our redemption. He paid the price of our salvation. He satisfied the righteous demands of a holy God, and God, therefore, is at peace. And God holds out a hand of peace to all mankind and says, if you'll come, I will in no wise cast you out. He's made it possible for all to be saved. Now, not everyone is saved. But the ground is cleared. All obstacles are gone. All that is left is for man to exercise his will and believe. Look at verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He's reconciled. Them. To God. You know, the only thing from God's perspective that prevents men from getting saved is their lack of faith. Their failure to exercise their free will. There's nobody that you and I meet that God will not save. 
It's a wonderful truth. Okay. When you and I meet somebody, God wants to save them because he says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So everyone that you and I meet, doesn't matter where we meet them, everyone that we meet, uh, God wants to save them. There is nothing from God's perspective that stops him from saving them. He has done it all. He has paid it all. He has finished it all. All that stops man from getting saved is their lack of faith that they will not believe that they're a sinner before a holy God and receive Jesus Christ as Savior as the only means of redemption. That's why Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The blood of the cross in this passage, Colossians chapter 1, speaks of the real physical death of Jesus Christ in our place, on our behalf, before God. That literal death in our place and that literal judgment he bore on our behalf is what saves us. Salvation is all of God. It's all of what Christ did upon Calvary. And he qualifies to be our Savior because he is the preeminent one. In him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. He's God, a very God. He became a man. He died in our place upon the cross of Calvary so that God might be satisfied, so that God might offer to all mankind redemption full and free. So that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the only thing that we have to do is believe. I would have to say this is one of my favorite passages in the whole of the New Testament. I love the doctrine of reconciliation. If you haven't got that point and thought that I don't enjoy it, I love it. When I teach theology in Bible college and I get to teaching on soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, and we get to the point of reconciliation, I love it. Because, beloved, the only thing that stops men from getting saved is their unwillingness to exercise their free will to be saved. God has done it all. The ground has been cleared. There is no obstacle between man and God. God says, come. There is nothing stopping you. There is no hurdles to jump. There is no rivers to swim. There is no mountains to climb. Just come. It's paid. It's finished. It's done. Just come. A man says, no, thank you. How foolish men will feel, won't they? When in eternity they open their eyes in the lake of fire and realize all they need to do was believe. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. It's true, isn't it? Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. It's all of him. I can now be saved. We have a glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. He is indeed the preeminent one. He is qualified to make us fit to be partakers of the inheritance and light. You see, that's how it starts in verse uh, 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet, made us fit, qualified you and I to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. How did he qualify us so that you and I could be partakers of the inheritance? He did it by his dear Son, who is God of very God, who made peace with God through the death shed blood upon the cross of Calvary. He is Savior, creator, head of the church, God of very God. No wonder Paul proclaimed in Colossians 1.18, in all things he might have the preeminence. Therefore, to give him prominence instead of preeminence is to dethrone him. God is pleased with his Son. Jesus Christ is honored and given preeminence john 5 23 and 24 says this that all men should honor the son 
even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Creator, the head of the church, the beloved of the Father. He is eternal God, and he lives, and he deserves to have our preem have preeminence. I wonder today, is Jesus Christ preeminence in your life? Does he have first place? You know, we often give him a place, but he deserves first place, for he is the all-sufficient, preeminent Savior. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word this day, and we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father God, that in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells, that he's God, a very God. We thank you that as the God-man, he died upon the cross of Calvary so that he might make it possible for all of us to be saved. And we thank you for the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. So with the Apostle Paul, we want to give thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. For all the praise and all the glory goes to you. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you for our redemption. And Lord, may we give our Savior the preeminence he deserves and give him the glory and the honor day by day so that, Father, we might witness and testify for you that others might know him who to know is life eternal. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing number 50. Nathan's going to come.